Okay, so I hope you had enough time to answer the bell work question, okay? Um, so again, this is from the video we're about to watch, okay? So um, I'm not going to give you the answers, all right? If you're still having a challenge, um, take some time after these notes and do it as part of your homework tonight, okay? If you're still challenged after that, see me before turning it in, because you're gonna lose points if you, just do, if you turn it in blank, okay? All right, so um, sit back for a minute, we'll watch this video. Not that video. All right, so in that video that you just watched, okay, there should definitely have been some things that jarred your memory from last semester, from last quarter, from the stuff that was on your midterm just a couple of weeks ago. So, what were they? I saw things like the inside of a cell and the organelles, the um, adenosine, the thiamine, the guanine, the cytosyl, the uh, uracil, cytosine, uracil, all of the um, pieces of the DNA molecule, the double helix, the people who discovered the DNA double helix, um, the names or abbreviations of all the proteins that could be made, and how we use the code of DNA to determine which proteins were going to be made. Um, I saw that in there. So, um, this we are building genetics is building on that stuff that we just learned okay but we also saw some new stuff there was a 
somebody else walking around in one of those videos looking at plants. We're going to figure out what that's all about as well today. So now these notes are several parts. This first part is, um, all, is a standalone and I'm going to collect it separately than the other parts, okay? And you don't even have the other parts yet in your notes packet. You'll be getting those next week. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> so what is heredity? Okay, it is the passing of genetic information from one generation to the next through reproduction. Reproduction. In order for heredity, heredity to occur, you need to have a mom and a dad. And that's called genetics. Studying heredity is called genetics. And if you're familiar with any of these families here, um, Tom Hanks and his son, you can see the familial, you know, familiarity. That's where the word familiarity comes from. The facial features of people, in, and that's Goldie Hawn and her daughter. Um, these were just, these weren't, well, I picked him. I picked uh, Will Smith and his family. But... The other two I didn't pick. But anyway, I like those actors. So you can see, and in your own family, if you line up all the people in your family, you can definitely see a familial resemblance between the people because of genetics, because of heredity, okay? Now, what are gene segments of? DNA, we know that. And that controls specific traits in organisms. So based upon the... the order of those subunits that, that meet up together when you're making proteins, that's the traits. That's what determines the traits of the organism. It's organized in the structures called chromosomes. So this is a review of stuff that we know already. Body cells contain two each of each kind of chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, one from each parent, and that means you have a diploid number. All these words should be coming back to you right now. So, and diploid is abbreviated as 2N. Remember that? So, the whole thing is broken down. You get the cell. You've got the cell core, which we know is the nucleus. Okay? In that nucleus is the chrom or the chromosomes, which if you unwind them, you get the double helix of the DNA with all the bases connecting together, with A going with T and C going with G, right? That's the code. So during, again, continuing our review here, during the formation of gametes, remember what gametes are, sperm and egg, I'm going to ask you that question later, the number of chromosomes is cut in half by meiosis, the production of sperm and egg, right? That makes the haploid number of chromosomes. Haploid, half, haploid. And we call that N, or one, and there's an invisible one in front of that, right? In humans, the diploid number is 46. Other organisms have less or more chromosomes, which means there are 23 pairs of homologous, remember homo means the same, chromosomes in each nucleus of every human body cell, somatic cell. Body cells are somatic cells, sex cells are gametes, okay? And the, that's the difference. Either you're haploid, like a sperm and an egg, or you're diploid, 46 in, in, the, in the fertilized or every other body cell, okay? So half of the chromosomes in an offspring result from sexual reproduction. The union of the egg and the sperm come, to get, come from the mother and the other half come from the father. I don't like where that sentence was formed, but anyway, you get, you get the picture. Half of them come from mom, half of them come from dad, okay? So that means the offspring inherits half of its genes, you, have inherited half of your genes from each parent. And that means you're different from your parent because you don't have all the, of your parents' genes. You only have half of them. Half of mom, half of dad, that makes you a mix. 
makes you special, makes you one of a kind. Because even though you have siblings, brothers and sisters, who are also half of mom and half of dad, remember what happens in meiosis, or in that crossing over where genes are mixed. So we're gonna learn more about this later. Not everybody gets the same genes, okay? That's why you, you may have brown hair, but your sibling has blonde hair. You may have blue eyes, but your sibling has brown eyes. You may be short, but your sibling's tall, vice versa, okay? You may be a boy, sibling's a girl. That's a big one. <laughs> so each new offspring is a result of fertilization, right? Of an egg by a different sperm. So each offspring inherits a different combination of those genes from its parents. Whoa, that was a little too fast, Mr. Keene. So except in the case of identical twins, but we will talk more about that at a later time, okay? So 23, 23, 46, and then you get the baby, okay? Which each cell has 46. All right, so now we're moving on. We did learn a little bit about this last time too, but remember what oogenesis is. Anything with OO in front means egg. Okay, so we're talking about the egg or the ovum. These words are synonymous. They mean the same thing. Oogenesis. Genesis means making. Making of eggs. That's what oogenesis means. 100% of the gametes contain the X chromosome. 0% contain the Y chromosome. They're eggs. They, they, they only carry the X chromosome. Okay? Now, spermatogenesis, on the other hand, is a 50-50 shot. Half of the sperm will carry the female chromosome. The other half of the sperm will carry the Y, or the male chromosome. So it's the sperm, remember, that determine the sex of the baby, because all the eggs are the same. It just depends on which sperm gets there, which makes it a male or a female. So two X's is a female. XY is the male, and you see this is the male, has the Y, and depending upon which sperm gets to which egg, you get this different sex of a baby, different um, gender, okay? Okay, so this is predictable. The probability of having a male or female or a baby with blue eyes or brown eyes or tall or short or whatever genetic trait you're looking for um, is actually able to be determined by using this tool called a Punnett square, this tool right here. Now in your notes, you're going to have lots of opportunities to practice using a Punnett square because this is a big part of this, this section of uh, this unit, okay? So in this case, the sex chromosomes of the possible male gametes are written on top, and um, the possible ones for the female are written on the left, okay? So you male symbol, female symbol, but it doesn't always have to be like that. Um, I typically write them the same way each time. It's not necessary, but I typically put the male at the top and the female on the left, just so there's no confusion, okay? All right, so. If you look here, it's very simple. We're gonna be going over this a lot more, but each box represents the possible offspring, the possibility of having the different types of offspring, okay? It's, the, it's not what the parent will get every single time. If you have a coin and you flip it, will it land on heads or tails? You don't know, it's a 50% shot, right? 50% will land on tails, 50% will land on heads. But could I get two heads two in a row? Could I get heads, heads, and then heads again? Sure I could. It's a probability. But if I did it 100 times, most likely it would be a 50-50 weight, okay? And that's what's going on here. They have a one quarter chance of having a baby with this material. A one quarter chance, a one quarter chance, a one quarter chance of having those particular genes that will give these particular traits. That's 
all this tool does. So a quarter, 25% will be purple, or 75% will be purple, and 25% will be white in this case of these plants. And we'll talk more about what this means. Okay, so if you don't have it yet, don't worry, you will. So right now we're actually going to practice. Yay! Okay, so we're going to complete this Punnett square to show the probability that the offspring will be either male or female. Okay, so if you look at the top, this, in this case the female is on the top and the male is on the sides because it doesn't really matter. So what percent is female, what percent is male? So if you have to fill it in. So put X and X here and X and Y here because remember the male is the one that carries the chance of having a, a Y, okay? And then you're gonna be able to tell what percentages. So this is how you do it. Okay, so X and X go on top of your, in your notes, okay? And then X and Y go there. So these are the, the um, traits, the genes that we are specifically studying for this probability case. You can do this for all different kinds of traits of, of an organism, okay? So if I get X and X, what percentage is going to be XX? All of these. How about X and Y? X and Y. So what percent is going to be female? 50%. What percent is going to be male? 50%. Okay. It's not always that easy. This is the easiest one. Starting off easy, okay? But it's usually that easy. So 50% for each, all right. So where did this information come from? Where, where did we learn this stuff? Well, it started a very long time ago, okay? This person, Mendel, Gregor Mendel, um, sorry, Gregor Mendel, was an Austrian monk who uh, lived in the 1800s and he, we're going to watch a little video, but he um, performed a series of experiments on pea plants. Peas. Peas that had purple, white, different color peas, green peas, yellow peas, wrinkled peas, smooth peas, um, tall plants, short plants. He did a series of experiments um, in the monastery that he lived in as a monk, okay? And um, he made, he produced plants with all different characteristics. And the plants grown from these seeds were referred to as purebred or pea generation. So when you, when you see pea, know that that's the parent purebred, parent or purebred. It's what you start with, okay? So purebred, pea generation, no, has nothing to do with that it's a pea. <laughs> pea as in pure bread. That's what that means. So, like others before him, he, Mendel noticed that when pure, tall plants, tall in the pea generation, pure, tall plants, were cross-pollinated with pure, short plants, all of the offspring, F1, generation, that's what we call the first generation, F1, okay, were tall. All of the offspring were tall. Where the short part of, the, of it go? It's like having a short mom and a tall dad and all the kids are tall, or vice versa, okay? Why, why did that happen? 100% of the offspring were tall. Now, since these F1 offspring were the result of one tall and one short, they're called hybrids. They're no longer genetically pure for tall. So if you wanted to have a race of tall people, you would have to pick all the tall people and genetically purify the genetic traits so that only tall offspring would be born. And that's what he found out was able to do with plants, okay? <clears throat> And so, but, but because it's a mix of tall and short, it's a hybrid. I'm going to explain what that means a little bit better in a moment, okay? 
So if all the offspring were tall, what happened to the short? Where did the short trait go? Where did, where the, sh if they were, sh the, this parent was short and this parent was tall, where did the short trait go? Where did the short gene go? That's the question here. The short trait was hidden and is not expressed. It's called recessive. You may have learned that from our activity yesterday. That's due tomorrow night. The writing one, the six emojis one. Um, but just know that it gets hidden. It's here. It's here. The little t. The gene for shortness is there, but the gene for tallness dominates over it. Okay, that's why it's called dominant and recessive, which we'll get to in a moment. So Mendel then found that if two hybrids, so now he took not pure breeds, but two hybrids and made them together, took the pollen, and, and so that, that's what he was doing in this picture here. He was using a paintbrush to take the pollen from one flower and fertilize the flower of another. And that's what he did. He, that's how he crossed them. Okay? Um, if they were cross-fertilized, the short plants became able to be expressed. Because if you took, and you're going to fill this in on your paper, okay? Fill all this in. The, this is the tall, these are the hybrids, right? from the F1 generation. Hybrid meaning it's got a mix of traits. He took those two and made them together. Big T, big T, that's gonna be tall, right? See? Big T, little t, that's also going to be tall, but it's a hybrid. Same here, big T, little t, going to be tall, but it's a hybrid also. And then little t, little t, whoa, now you've got a short plant. So a quarter, not one out of four, it's not like you have four babies and this is what they're gonna look like. No, no, no. Remember, this is the probability. This is the chance that you will have this number of offspring with these traits. So. By chance, a quarter of them will be um, pure tall. A quarter of them will be pure short, and 50% of them, it's a question right off of your final exam, guys, okay? 50% of them will be hybrids, but tall. Any questions, I will pause the video and answer them, okay? If you don't want to ask right now, write them down in the margin of your notes and I will answer them later, okay? So um, you were supposed to also write short plants were expressed and 75 and 25, yeah. So 75% of them are tall, 25% are short, 25% are um, pure or 50% are pure 25% pure tall, 25% pure uh, short, and 50% hybrid tall, okay? So that's what the numbers mean. They're gonna ask you numbers like this on the EOC. I'm gonna ask you questions like this on your test for this unit. So you have to know what all those different percentages, where they came from. But again, we're gonna practice some more, okay? All right, so why was Mendel able to detect and explain patterns of heredity while previous researchers failed to do so. So unlike researchers before him, Mendel used an organized scientific approach. He detailed characteristics of pea plants in each generation. Others did not do that. He recorded his information and was, you know, used specific techniques to fertilize different parts of you know, the flower, the male and the female from um, different traits, and then 
when he when they matured, month this this think about this. This took years because you have to wait for the plants to grow to maturity, then you have to fertilize them, wait till they form fruit, collect the fruit, you know, or get, gather all the data, and then plant them to see what the offspring resulted in, and then record that information, and then go to the next generation. So this took a long time, and he was just studying, okay? He cultivated 30,000 plants. Think about how long it would take to do that, right? He followed the traits through the generations in order to determine, oh, this is what I keep getting, so this must be fact, okay? Unfortunately, his information got lost for about 75 years. We'll talk about that in, in a little while. All right, so he kept track of specific genetic traits, like I just said. So these are some of them. Plant height, tall versus short. Flower color, white versus purple. Seed color, green versus yellow. And seed shape, wrinkled versus smooth, or round uh, versus wrinkled, okay? And he observed similar patterns of inheritance for all of these traits. So these are what they look like, okay? Well, I mean, obviously tall and short, but um, these are the different green or yellow or wrinkled or round. Um, even the pods, green or yellow pods, white or purple flowers. And then this is essentially uh, the parent generation, the F1 generation, and the F2 generation, and determining what the results were. So pretty amazing that he spent all that time. He never actually saw a gene or DNA. These were not discovered yet. These were not um, factors or features that were discoverable at that time. We didn't have the technology to do so. But by careful observation and logic, he reasoned that something was transferred from the parents to the offspring, something. And he called that thing the unchanging factors. Something was being passed on from generation to generation. Now, of course, we know that these factors are genes today, okay? We know that the, this factor is DNA, but he didn't know that. And this is what I was talking about before. His work was largely ignored. It was more than it was ignored, it was kind of lost. He was in a monastery. Scientists didn't go to clergymen, to you know, churches, for scientific evidence. <clears throat> that, that wasn't something that was done. So his work sat on a shelf for about, I think it was roughly about 75 years. Um, maybe it wasn't 75 years. This looks like 45 years or, or yeah, 35 years, whatever. It was a long time, okay? Um, and so by the time his work was rediscovered, I don't know that story. I'd like to know about it, but um, by this time, chromosomes had been stained and microscopes used and observed cells in the process of mitosis. And meiosis had already been described in detail. So these things that you are familiar with now, mitosis is growth and repair, right? Growing from a baby to an adult or fixing boo-boos. Or meiosis, remember, was the creation of sperm or egg cells. Um, whoa, yeah, okay. So at this point, biologists realize that chromosomes carry the hereditary factors referred to by Mendel in his research paper. And in today's terms, Mendel's hereditary factors are called genes. I mentioned that before, but here's the actual notes for it. The two versions of a gene are called what? And if you said alleles, you are correct, because that was one of our words in our work from yesterday, all right? So <clears throat> here's a chromosome with two sister chromatids, one from mom, one from dad, and you've got alleles on each chromosome for the same trait. They could be eye color, hair color, those are just examples, but two versions of every gene. 
All right, so we are going to finish up um, with this video about Gregor Mendel, okay? And you are to write in your notes three facts about Mendel while watching the video that are new to you, not from the notes, so new information, and three facts about his pea plant experiments that are new to you. So the first three are about the person, and the next three are about his work. You understand? Okay. And this is, this is going to finish up the notes for today, this video. My job is to make college easier because students have a lot Today I have for you a sizzling tale of a chubby little friar who changed the world with a garden full of pea plants. Today's great mind in science is Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk who in the mid-1800s single-handedly fathered modern genetics. But even though Mendel was a man of God, as it were, he and his pea plants have been the focus of one of the biggest scientific scandals in history. Oh lord, I love a good scientific scandal. <laughs> Mendel was born in 1822 in what was then Austria, but is now the Czech Republic. His parents were super, super poor, but the young Gregor was such a precocious little scamp that they spent all of their money educating him. That is, at least until his dad was injured in a farming accident, which I imagine is the number one occupational hazard associated with being a pre-industrial revolution Austrian peasant. His family did what they could to help him out, but eventually Mendel decided that being an Augustinian monk didn't seem so bad. Now I'll point out here that the record of Mendel's life and work are pretty spotty actually because the priest who dealt with his personal effects after his death got rid of almost everything, not knowing how extraordinarily important it all was. But one of the very few of Mendel's papers that survived, Mendel let on that he was not called to the church as some people were. My circumstances decided my vocational choice, is how he put it. Anyway, in 1843, Mendel moved into the monastery at Brno, Austria, and this turned out to be a pretty good move for him because he basically got sent to college for free. And, you know, dating is such a drag. We need that anyway. After a failed attempt at becoming a science teacher, he started spending all of his free time in the gardens with some common garden peas. And being a scientist at heart, he started doing experiments on them. For the record, right now, you and I don't care who you are, you know much, much more about how heredity works than Mendel did when he started, not to mention chromosomes and DNA. At the time, microscopes weren't good enough to even observe basic cell division, so nobody knew dog squat about how sexual reproduction worked. In Mendel's day, it was generally thought that making a baby was uh, putting the parent's genetic material into a blender and just mixing it up real good. People assumed, for example, that if a white squirrel and a black squirrel were to have babies, their offspring would be great. What Mendel discovered, after whispering sweet nothings to a yard full of pea plants for eight years, was that this line of thinking was exactly entirely wrong. Mendel set us straight on the fundamental properties of inheritance, which eventually paved the way for the development of modern genetics. Mendel's choice of research subjects for this endeavor was shockingly perfect for one important reason. The traits that he studied, the color of pea flowers and the color and textures of the peas themselves, are only determined by a single gene. This turns out not to be the case for almost every physical trait in most organisms. In fact, the vast majority of inherited traits are either the product of two or more genes working together to determine, say, eye color or ear shape, or the product of one trait having a hand in a bunch of different physical traits. How did Mendel know that? How did he know? Well, he probably started out by noticing that the flowers of his pea plants in the garden were purple most of the time, but then every once in a while, they produced white ones. Since he studied heredity in college, he knew that the way to get to the bottom of this was to create true breeding lines of purple flower peas and a true breeding line of white flower peas. So he brought the purple ones together uh, for successive generations until he was getting purple flowers all of the time and did the same thing for the white ones. Having done this, Mendel then started a series of extremely methodical experiments in which he bred the purely purple flowered and the purely white flowered plants together. And in doing this for successive generations, he eventually realized, God didn't himmel the pea flowers are white almost exactly one quarter of the time. This led him to three important conclusions. Important conclusion number one, Mendel discovered that pea plants were inheriting a pair of genetic instructions from each parent. Sometimes both instructions from a parent would tell the flower to be purple, sometimes they'd both be for white flowers, and sometimes there would be one 
instruction for each. Mendel called these versions of a gene passed from parent to offspring factors, but these days we call them alleles. And so the baby pea plant had two alleles for flower color, one chosen randomly from mom and one chosen randomly from dad. And these genetic instructions, the genotype as we call it now, decided what the outward appearance of the pea flower, the phenotype, was going to be. Important conclusion number two, Mendel also found that the allele for purple flowers was stronger or more dominant than the white allele, which was recessive. Since the purple allele was dominant and the white was recessive, a plant inheriting one purple and one white allele would produce purple flowers. Important conclusion number three, even though the purple allele was dominant, that didn't mean that it was being tossed into the mix more often. It was just being expressed more often. In fact, Mendel concluded that which trait a parent was throwing into the ring, purple or white, was totally random. But a dominant allele was always going to trump a recessive allele. So through these three conclusions, Mendel came up with a hard and fast rule about genetic inheritance, Mendel's first law, or the law of segregation, that says that every individual possesses two alleles for any particular trait, like for example flower color, and which allele a parent gives its offspring is completely random. The offspring then has one allele from mom and one allele from dad, and of those two alleles, the dominant one is the one trait that the offspring will express. If and when both of the alleles happen to be recessive, only then will the recessive trait be expressed. But Mendel went even farther with his pea plants. And no, I'm not going to shut up about pea plants. It's fascinating, okay? And he got similar results in his experiments on the seeds of the pea plants, which are the peas. He discovered that two traits of the pea, its color and its skin texture, had nothing to do with each other. Now, his peas could be either green or yellow in color, either have smooth or wrinkly skin. Mendel found that when he took a smooth yellow pea and crossed it with a green wrinkly pea, he could, with the same mathematical precision as he did with the flower, predict the ratio of yellow smooth, yellow wrinkly, green smooth, and green wrinkly peas. So the other rule that Mendel contributed to our understanding of genetics is Mendel's second law, or the law of independent assortment, which says that separate genes are passed independently from each other from parent to offspring. In this case, two dominant traits in peas, the wrinkliness and the yellowness, were unrelated. Pretty big deal, right? Well, Mendel ended up writing a paper called Versuch uber Franzen Hyperden, if you'd sprechen Sie Deutsch, which clearly I do not. And that was published in a little rinky-dink scientific journal, and he presented his findings to the equivalent of some 19th century garden clubs. He also sent this paper to every fancy pants scientist he could think of, but here's the thing. The big shots don't like to take notice of him because none of them knew what the hell he was talking about. Mendel's work was so far ahead of its time that his experiments didn't even make sense to his contemporaries. In fact, his data didn't become useful to researchers until nearly 35 years after he published them. So Mendel lived for another 20 years or so after he published his findings. By all accounts, he was a totally happy dude. He became the abbot of the monastery, and he had a lot of smart friends who liked to talk science. His doctor had him smoking 20 or so cigars every day to help him lose weight. Not an effective strategy, if anybody's interested. But he was never recognized for the monolithic contributions he made to science during his lifetime. But then, around 1900, scientists were independently working to figure out what Mendel had already discovered, because there were a lot of people still going around hollering, Oh, white squirrel, black squirrel, my gray squirrel! Which was, by now, becoming more and more obviously wrong. Microscopes had gotten a lot better and more powerful, and people were observing chromosomes. They had no idea what they were, but they were observing them. And it wasn't until a group of scientists dug up Mendel's papers and applied his laws to discoveries that had been made since that everybody working on heredity put down their beakers and were like, Oh. And suddenly the scientific community was totally bonkers for Gregor Mendel. He was heralded as the father of modern genetics, and they made a little special shrine to him at his test garden at the monastery. And scientists would make pilgrimages there to weep over his hoes and shovels and stuff. Okay, I don't know about that last part. But the point is that suddenly Gregor Mendel became a very big deal. And then, in 1936, this statistician named Ronald Fisher published a paper examining Mendel's data. Fisher was like, hey, you guys, um, I love Mendel and everything, but have you looked at his data? They're really good, like really good, like maybe statistically implausible. Fisher was a statistician and a geneticist and a big Mendel fan, so in his research of Mendel's paper, he admitted that in a lot of ways, Mendel really was the methodical genius superhero scientist that everyone gave him credit for being. But he also saw that all of Mendel's data corroborated his theory really well. Like, the data turned out to be eerily perfect for thousands of plants and dozens of experiments conducted over the eight years. So Fisher was like, uh, in conclusion, someone might have probably kind of fiddled with Mendel's data, but it definitely wasn't Mendel. It could have been one of his assistants, maybe? Because 
you know, Fisher hated to do it. He buried most of the really incriminating evidence about the data fiddling in the back of the paper. And some people read it, but most people didn't, so it didn't cause much of a kerfuffle at first. But when the Mendel Centennial celebrations came along in the 1960s, some people dug up Fisher's paper, and all of a sudden the scientific community went all animal planet on Mendel. Like, this guy, he existed before science, so we can't give him a super hard time about being like, well, that must have crossed that P wrong. Don't include that one in the data. He didn't know about science. This was before real, this was before like good science was being done. He was a monk. Give him a break. Even now there are Mendel Fisher controversy aficionados out there who talk about this stuff till the wives go out. Nearly 50 years later, people are still writing books and papers about it, most of them trying to prove that Mendel was completely faultless. But nobody's been able to uh, explain what Fisher found, the apparent data fiddling, selective reporting, omission, whatever you want to call it. The important thing is that Mendel put us all on the right track, and of course genetics ended up being way, 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 way more convoluted than Mendel's work could explain. But what Mendel gave us was a firm hypothesis on which to base other studies by countless other geneticists who worked to discover and understand chromosomes and DNA in the 20th century. Today, traits that have been shown to operate under Mendel's laws, like albinism, are known as Mendelian traits. There are lists of these traits in humans and in other animals, we put some links to those down in the description. If you have an idea for a a great mind that you'd like us to profile, please let us 